Hello everybody, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Debtor Club, and I'm happy to introduce the last day of our conference, Evicted by Greed, Global Finance, Housing and Resistance. Uh, together with me, there is Lieke Plucher, the co-director of the Disruption Debtor Club, and also uh, Christoph Trautwetter that uh, um, will uh, lead the tour in Berlin uh, to discover uh, anonymous and aggressive investors. And uh, I'm passing now the word to Lieke to introduce the, the rest of the program of today and also to explain how this tour came to life. Yeah, thank you, Tatiana. So my name is Lieke Plucher and I'm directing the community program of the Disruption Network Lab. And yeah, we decided to do an online version of this tour because uh, there was, of course, the coronavirus outbreak. So we were not able to meet all together at the end of March to walk through Berlin. But instead, we produced an online version of the tour, which, of course, also has the benefit that now more people are able to join us because originally the tour was only for 20 people and it was sold out actually quite quickly. So now we are able to have more of, a, more of you online. So that's actually a nice side effect. And also we decided to make a video production of the tour, which we will also make available later on. So the video was produced by uh, the team of the Disruption Network Lab. So we would like to thank everybody who was involved in that. Uh, first of all, Elena Veljanovska and Nada Baker, the project managers at the Disruption Lab. Then Jonas Franke, who worked on the design and graphics. Uh, Steph Lenk, who was involved in the communication. And the amazing video team we had for the tour production, uh, Gabriel, Gonzalo, and Ankel. And uh, also we want to thank uh, Ranov, who is doing the live streaming for us today. And speaking of videos, uh, we of course had the conference Evicted by Greed this weekend. And we have also made available some in-depth videos that go into more detail for each of the speakers. And you can find them at our website, uh, disruptionlab.org slash evicted minus videos and we will also share the link to that in the chat and then we would like to thank the rosa luxemburg stiftung for their support and collaboration in making this tour possible and also the reimagine europe project which is co-funded by the creative europe program of the european union so before we start with the tour i uh, would just like to say also that it's based on the findings of a very interesting project that christoph trautwetter worked on which is called Wem gehört die Stadt, which is of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And this project deals with the ownership structure of Berlin, and it is collecting data from various groups. And recently they published a very interesting study, uh, Keine Transparenz trotz Transparenzregister. And this is all about the anonymity in the Berlin real estate markets, which we will also go more in detail into today. Um, and then since uh, it's great that you're all joining us for the tour, we would also, of course, like to have some version of online participation. So you can join the chat and ask any questions there during the tour. And you can ask questions at any time for any of the segments of the tour. And then we will collect them and ask them to Christoph in between the fragments. Um, and it's also, of course, always nice if you want to say something about who you are and why you're joining. And so we know a bit about who is in the chat. Um, yeah, then handing over to Christoph to give a short welcome and then we will continue on our tour. Thanks, Tatiana. Thanks, Lika, for the introduction. I welcome you twice actually today to the tour, once now in live and then uh, very shortly in the video. And uh, you will be able to spot the difference between the time when I recorded the video and, um, and today. So without uh, keeping you any longer, uh, enjoy the tour, enjoy the video, and uh, we'll meet again in about 10 minutes after our first stop at Potsdamer Platz. Welcome to Visiting the Invisible, a tour of Berlin that is different in two ways. First is virtual, so instead of walking through the town, You'll see seven clips, and in between the clips, you'll get the chance to ask questions. Second, I'm not going to take you to the normal sites of Berlin, but instead I'm going to show you some normal residential houses in Kreuzberg, 
and the stories they have to tell about financialization and anonymous investments. We start our tour in Potsdamer Platz, not because it has beautiful historical buildings, actually everything around here, nearly everything was built quite recently, but because it's a perfect playground for international financial markets. Before we start our tour though, I want to show you a few numbers. If you look at those numbers, there are two things that you can see. First of all, real estate is really big. Around the world, real estate makes up half or even more of the national wealth. In Berlin, that's 500 to 700 billion euros worth of bricks, mortar and especially land that you find. Second, it, there's not just one real estate market. Actually, there's a commercial real estate market that has usually big and very frequent transactions and that is dominated by the international financial market investors. And second, there's a more traditional residential real estate market. So think couples buying an apartment uh, for the rest of their lives, doctors buying a house to invest for their retirement. So many but very small transactions and usually long time spans of investment. And in between those two, and that's going to be the focus today, there's financialized residential real estate, meaning several houses being packed up in packages and sold and traded and speculated just like you would see it in the commercial real estate markets. So let's start our tour. Imagine you're standing at the crossroads of Potsdamer Platz, facing south, around 6 o'clock. Take a turn to the right, between 7 and 9 o'clock. You will see the Akan, a complex of shopping centers, offices, even a cinema. And this whole complex was bought by Brookfield in 2016 for about 1.4 billion euros. And at the moment, it's worth approximately 1.7 billion. Now, in this complex of the Arcade, you can see the international financial markets at its best. But to see that, we have to go to the Luxembourg Trade Registry. Luckily for us, it's completely virtual and free. So let's go there. If you type Potsdamer Platz in the Luxembourg Corporate Register, you will get a list of results and all of those are companies, which means the Arcaden complex was packed up into small corporate shells, which makes it much easier in the future to sell those companies. So if you want to um, sell a part of the Arcaden in the future, if Brookfield decides to sell, all they have to do is to sell shares in those Luxembourg companies. They don't have to go to the notary in Germany. And most of all, they don't have to pay transaction tax, real estate transaction tax, which is 6% of the transaction value in Berlin. Those are the so-called share deals um, that make it much easier for investors to speculate because they save at each step of the transaction this um, transaction tax. And what you can also see in the corporate register in Luxembourg is the financials. And if you look at the financials of, uh, of Brookfield, you can go down here to the Consolidated accounts of 2018, you find the value of the current value of the buildings that I told you before, that was 1.7 billion. You find the rent income and you also find the expenses and the profits and the taxes that they pay. And what you usually see with these kind of companies of the international financial markets, they are housed in Luxembourg without much of employees, owned by a partnership from the Cayman Islands, a tax haven in the, in the Pacific, close to the US, and they shift a lot of money, interest money. In this case, it's about 24 million out of the 62 million of rent income from Germany via Luxembourg to the Cayman Islands, again to save tax. After this short excursion to the Luxembourg Corporate Registry, let's get back to the middle of Potsdamer Platz. If you continue turning between 10 and 12 o'clock, you see the Sony Center. 
It's another prime example of the international financial markets at play. It was sold first in 2010 to the Korean pension fund for around 600 million. Seven years later, it increased in value by 500 million euros when it was sold to investors again from Canada and the US and again as a shed here. So no tax was paid on that transaction. Now, if you continue trading at about two o'clock, slightly hidden behind the construction site, you'll see the Mall of Berlin. At the time of its construction in 2014, 2015, it was also actually called the Mall of Shame because it was built by Romanians that allegedly worked for six euros per hour for a subcontractor and in the end weren't even paid this salary that is uh, not even legal in Germany because the subcontractor went bankrupt. And this subcontractor again in turn worked for a very famous German project developer that builds um, shopping centers around Berlin and around Germany. And he is not the owner of the building at the moment. Very soon, with money from the Bavarian pension insurance, he sold the building to, the, to Arab Investments Limited, an investment company from the UK that again has investors from around the world, probably most probably from the Arab world, um, that we don't know of. So anonymous investors behind Arab Investments Limited that own this Mall of Berlin. And up, on top of the Mall of Berlin, you will see some residential houses, actually one of the few places uh, to live here around Potsdamer Platz, at least if you can afford about 5,000 euros of rent per month. So you can see here uh, what you can get for this uh, 5,000 euros a month. You'll get a very nice um, inward facing uh, and very big and comfortable apartment. Let's end our tour of Potsdamer Platz with one of the last construction sites here. And what's remarkable in this construction site, maybe you've seen it before, is the sign of names that usually goes with a construction site. What is usually missing in this big list of names is the name of the owner. In this case, we're actually lucky. There's a company called F100 and Freo that you can see here. If you go to their website, you'll actually find your way to the owner that is an investment company from Switzerland. But there's a problem. Switzerland is a secrecy jurisdiction, so ownership in Switzerland is not very transparent. Luckily, in this case, the ownership goes through Luxembourg and Luxembourg is obliged to tell us the final owners of each of the companies that is registered there. And there's, since 2019, a new register that's called the Beneficial Ownership Register. And uh, before we end our tour, let's have a very quick look um, what this beneficial ownership register tells us. You will see here the names of the final owners of this construction site in the middle of Potsdamer Platz. It's a guy called uh, Julius Beer. There's a bank and a banking family in Switzerland called this, but uh, I haven't found the son with this birth date and this um, also birth town that is stated in the register related to that family. So either until now I don't know who is the owner and we can only we don't can only suspect that he owns the building through, through several foundations or other construction in Switzerland. So only medium helpful. And one last thing about this uh, sign of names, what you can also not see is the consultant that uh, the company hired when they were trying to get the building permit in the site. Um, they hired a former SPD city councillor that was responsible for um, construction and city planning. And they managed with the help of this advisor to be allowed not to build any um, flats, any houses for living, as it was usually uh, necessary, usually foreseen in the planning. Um, but they could only build offices that usually create a bigger profit for them. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Christoph, for this uh, first part of the tour. 
Uh, while we are waiting for the questions of the audience, I also wanted to uh, mention uh, that uh, leading to this tour, we had a lot of conversation. Uh, you were part of our conference as a keynote also on uh, Friday, uh, together with uh, Manuel Gabar de Sousse, uh, speaking about uh, the global finance, uh, acquiring uh, more and more assets uh, in the city of Berlin. Um, and uh, uh, while we were also discussing about this tour, uh, you were mentioning me that Potsdamer uh, Platz is quite interesting as a site because um, is uh, really where the financialization of the 90s uh, started in the cities. But it's also the place uh, that the people uh, uh, care the least because uh, nobody actually lives there and it's difficult to mobilize people to make a resistance and trying to um, confront this kind of financialization and global finance uh, and uh, uh, problematic that you just described uh, on the video. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you could elaborate a bit more on that, uh, uh, what happened in the 90s, uh, also through your personal experience, you have been uh, living uh, in uh, the city since long, uh, and uh, actually Potsdamer Platz is uh, quite an interesting site also to understand in this uh, development and this process that happened since uh, many years. Um, so I will leave it to you to tell us a bit more about uh, uh, what is the background of this specific site? Okay, so historically, actually, Potsdamer Platz was in the middle of the border between Eastern and Western Germany. Uh, and it was also a place where you had uh, big train stations coming from the south ending there. So after reunification, this part of Berlin was completely rebuilt. Berlin built a new central train station at Hauptbahnhof and the old uh, southern station at Anhalter Bahnhof was closed. Uh, so it, it, when I first came to Berlin in the 90s, I came to Potsdamer Platz and you had a, a viewing platform of the whole area and it was a huge construction site. Uh, and that's, that's why I'm saying uh, it was, it's a perfect playground for um, financial investors because uh, it was all planned from scratch, reconstructed uh, and newly, newly put there. Um, with a lot of uh, foreign investors who prefer usually to invest in commercial buildings and historically prefer commercial buildings um, because they're much easier to trade, much easier to deal with, much bigger packages, much easier to invest big of money. Uh, and it's only been very recently that uh, financial market investors, investment funds, pension funds discovered residential housing um, here in Berlin and a few other places in the world. Thank you. And in between, I also see the audience uh, asking the first question. Uh, I read it to you. <laughs> I know you have mentioned uh, registers. Uh, and what do you mean uh, uh, by registers? Do you mean the place these purchases need to be recorded from the government? And if not, uh, how is the government made aware of these purchases? Uh, what part of the government would be responsible to keeping track of this? Right, so when I talk about registers, there are different registers. I, we have looked at the corporate register in Luxembourg, where every company that is based in Luxembourg has to register. And we've seen the beneficial ownership register in Luxembourg that is the same. It's for companies based in Luxembourg. And then in Berlin, obviously, there is the land register. And in the land register, anyone who wants to buy a building properly uh, with his, in his own name has to register, take a notary and register in the land register. And then the German government takes note and charges the transfer tax. But what happens, and that's uh, that I've mentioned it quickly in the share deals, if you don't buy the building directly, but you buy the company that owns the building, actually there's nowhere in Germany uh, that you have to register and the government is not able to keep track of the ownership changing because it happens in Luxembourg and there is no German uh, agency involved and not even a duty to record the sale with the tax agencies. So what happens in many cases when buildings change the owner somewhere abroad in some tax haven, some secrecy jurisdiction, no one in Germany actually noticed that the ownership has changed. And there is also another question. Is there a legal right for us to know who owns what property? 
did it used to be the case and then laws uh, were changed? So tenants have the right to know who owns their building, but that is only the direct owner, the legal owner. So tenants in Berlin can go to the land register and ask uh, who is registered there. But this doesn't mean they, they know who owns the final building um, because they're always or very often corporate structures like the one we've seen in Luxembourg, Switzerland, and even in more obscure places. Um, so it's impossible for people to find out who owns their building um, at two levels because the land register is open only at very, very limited cases. And then the corporate register, and that's a global problem, um, allows secrecy. Um, and uh, this is still allowed, secrecy is still allowed and is often excused by some investors wanting to be anonymous and protected from evil wives or husbands or um, other people that uh, would want to take away their money. But um, I agree to the last question that sec secrecy shouldn't be legal and it's possible to forbid. So we go on with the next session. Do you want to introduce it? I think uh, again, um, I, will, I will introduce the next station by itself, but uh, we are moving on now, uh, just a short walk towards uh, Checkpoint Charlie. On our way to Kreuzberg, let's have a short stop at Checkpoint Charlie and join the other tourists. You've probably heard of the historical dispute between the US and the Russians here at this point, and you've probably seen pictures or in real, the guards that guarded the free world at this point. There is a more recent dispute here that involves the construction on the former eastern side, the former Russian side um, of Berlin here, of Czech And it has on one side the investor called Trockland that wants to build a hard rock hotel, an underground museum and several other buildings here and the city of Berlin and some noisy architects who want more open space and a more prominent place for the museum. Funny enough, on the side of the investors, there is again a Russian involved. And the finance manager of Trockland is a, for, is a Russian banker. And he's also the, the son-in-law of the deceased Turkmen dictator that had a reputation for stealing a lot of money from the Turkmenish gas resources. A little further behind, a little off the beaten track of the tourists, you can actually see one of the developments of Trockland um, that has already taken shape. And even though it's not my cup of tea, I would say the aesthetical value of this construction is a bit dubious. But what is more dubious is actually the partners that have invested here. This time you find them actually in the German trade register which unfortunately, unlike the Luxembourgish, is not as virtual and not as free. But I downloaded the list of shareholders for you. And if you have a look inside, you'll see it in this one and also in other, uh, other Trockland investments around Berlin. You'll see anonymous structures, like for example, gold leaves from Liechtenstein. You'll see Vladimir Sokolov, the Russian banker that I've talked about. And you see the family of the late Turkmen dictator, his wife, his father, the widow, um, her daughter and her great grandchildren that all own shares in companies that own investments of Totland throughout the city. And there's been a debate about that um, in the city. Lika, we cannot hear you. Sorry, let's try that again. So while we're waiting to hear questions from the audience, uh, I was also interested to ask you more about uh, the trade registries and how it works to get this information. So you mentioned before that the Luxembourg trade registry is actually open and available for free. But for the German uh, registry, this is different. So how did you manage to get such information from the German corporate registry? Okay, I think that's a very important information for German tenants. 
um, there is a place called North Data or Offener Register online uh, where you can find German companies and you can type the name. And if you type the name of any com German company in Google, you will find nice lists of corporate structures and everything for free. But the problem, all of those open data doesn't have the owners. So if you want to know the owner of a German company, you have to either go physically to the court that houses the register in, in Berlin, that's the Amtsgericht Charlottenburg next to Bahnhof Zoo, or you have to register online and pay one euro 50 each, and then you will get the PDFs uh, or sometimes pictures uh, of the ownership lists. Um, and there's also just a warning, you can also buy these lists for 20 euros each online, but if you go there for real or register online, it's only 150. So I always uh, remind and encourage everyone, every tenant who wants to know the owner to do that uh, and just download, download this list for one euro 50 or let me know and I can download it for you. Ah, that's a great tip as well. Thanks. Um, so there was a quite specific question from somebody. So let's see if we are able to get to an answer. So someone asked that he's always been curious about how they built on top of the former embassy building, which is called the Esplanade. So the Himmel über Berlin. And do you know maybe who owns this former embassy, which is now a fancy restaurant and also some housing? And if this wasn't some kind of Denkmal shoots situation? Or maybe you know more in general about this practice of building like on top of other buildings? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of who owns. I, the name sounds, um, sounds familiar, but... Um... I don't know the owner. So in, in that case, um, there's uh, two options. Uh, usually if you if that's um, very prominent buildings in Berlin, uh, you can already check online and you have sometimes you're lucky to find the owner of the building um, or at least the company that is related to the building without actually going to the land register. But if that doesn't help, you would actually have to try to uh, to get the information from the land register. And you'd have to bring a justified interest because not everyone can just go to the land register and ask, hey, who owns this building and who is uh, who is building uh, there on top? You'd have to uh, say, I'm a journalist writing about money laundering or I think there's a suspicion of misuse in any way. And then you might get a chance to have a look at it. Um, and as I said, unfortunately, I'm not, a, uh, not able to answer your question uh, like that. Um, but if you like, um, I can check after the tour and um, we can we can have a look at it together. Yeah, then maybe before we go on to the next section, maybe you could say something about how people could get in touch with you if they want to ask you more specifically about uh, um, a part of your research. What would be the best way for them to contact you? I'm a, I'm a bit old fashioned, so <laughs> you can still write me emails. <laughs> um, you find my you should find my email um, online. It's the uh, wem gehört die Stadt, so wgds at posteo.de or .de, um, or you will find me on the Netzwerk Steuergerechtigkeit uh, with my full name. I think uh, just if you Google a bit, you'll find my name and address, uh, and maybe we can also make it available as part of the tour. Yeah, we'll find a way to share it or otherwise people could also always write us at uh, the Disruption Lab and we'll make a way to make the contact. So then let's move on to our next section. Would you like to introduce it, Christoph, or we go straight to the to the video? All right, maybe uh, we're getting to Kreuzberg now. So that's uh, where I actually wanted to start and have the tour. So those two stops were just a bit of an introduction. And now uh, we'll get to the place um, that I think uh, is more important for the people and for the struggle against uh, foreign investors. And I've said it yesterday, uh, Kreuzberg, I think, is the heart, maybe, so to say, of the resistance against uh, financialization, because here 95% of the population is actually living for rent. And that's a completely unique situation. And we have a very left government also ready to take uh, measures against investors and a, a very vibrant mix of tenants uh, fighting for their right. Um, so I think we, we're entering the heart of the struggle against financialized housing and resistance in Kreuzberg. So have enjoy. We are now entering Kreuzberg and arriving at Hallisches Tor. In front of you, you see Mehringplatz. 
and it's surrounded by the typical cost-saving post-war um, architecture. The square Meringplatz was actually named after a Marxist historian called Franz Mehring, who was also a politician of the Social Democrats. And actually the headquarters of today's Social Democrat Party is just a stone throw from here. The eastern side of Meringplatz is owned by the city of Berlin and the social housing. And we're going to have a closer look at the western side. Tenants here have complained about rotting basements, unresponsive managers, and drug dealers openly going about their business just a few steps away from the headquarters of the Social Democrat Party. And they have called for help from the city or the council, the administration of Kreuzberg. The buildings around here are owned by a company called SAF Select Evolution One. And it took a bit more research to find out who's behind that company. You can see it here in the picture. On the top, it's an investment fund called Optimum Evolution. It's based, as most investment funds are, in Luxembourg. The managers are Italians with a link to Malta. And the investors are unknown, even though despite the beneficial ownership register in Luxembourg, because none of them owns more than 25%, which would qualify them to enter in this beneficial ownership register. So that's a typical picture of investment funds. If you're an investor in an investment fund, you usually own five, 10% of the investment fund and you never appear in the beneficial ownership register. So that means the only person who knows about the investor is the investment manager, in this case, the Italian guy based in Malta. And considering the stories we've heard about Malta, at least I would have some doubts about who those investors could be. Now, as we know, for the Luxembourg companies, we can have a look in the corporate register and have a look at the perspective of the investors. From their perspective, the fund is in the optimization phase. The value of the buildings is increasing. It actually increased by more than 100 million euros last year. And the rents are being optimized, which from the point of the investor means rising. I would say that's in stark contrast to what the tenants tell us and what the tenants tell us of this building. But that's the way it is. Well, so, yeah. Um, let's see if there's also questions from the audience, but I had quite an obvious question after seeing this situation um, where we see the buildings are deteriorating a lot and the tenants are quite unhappy, but then also the rent has been increasing over time. So how is it possible for this company to get away with that? So there are different strategies, obviously, um, the housing market in Berlin or the residential housing market in Berlin is strongly regulated in theory. So tenants have an unlimited right to stay in their apartment and rents uh, or the increase of rents is limited. Um, so there's a, a compar compar comparable rent and rents cannot go above this comparable rent. Uh, and they can only increase by 5% a year or 15% every three years. Um, so in theory, rents are strongly kept, but investors um, take different measures to change that. Um, Berlin has also very strong demand. So tenants desperately or people desperately looking for a place and renting rundown apartments for higher rents. So one important way of investors to increase uh, rents is to get rid of tenants um, and they use uh, different and sometimes uh, more or less legal methods to get rid of them. Uh, another method is the so-called renoviction. Um, so you do some, uh, some renovation that might not even help the tenants. So in, in, the, in the building that we saw, they renovated the facade that was still rather intact, but uh, didn't take care of the water pipes and the basement and the things that really matter for the tenants. So for, from, for the investor, it looks nice from the outside and they could pass on the costs for this renovation to the tenants uh, above the normal cap of, uh, of what the rents could increase. So they use renovations not to make, uh, make life better for the tenants, uh, but to make rents more expensive and more lucrative for themselves. 
All right, we have a question now from the audience. If you know if there are actual eviction notices being sent to these tenants, or is it just via pressure that they do no repairs, etc.? Um, so the tenants in that building um, don't receive, at least to my knowledge, um, um, eviction notices. So the building is, there's some, some limited cases where you can uh, send eviction notices. Um, if you say, for example, the building is not, um, uh, it's not possible to maintain the building as it is and you have to tear it down or you have to uh, renovate completely. Uh, then you can evict some people or if the owner says he needs the building for himself or for a family member, um, which an investment fund obviously cannot do. Um, so there are no uh, eviction notices, but it's uh, pressure uh, on the one hand by the increasing rents and on the other hand um, by ab abandonment and just being unresponsive uh, and having bad environment in the building, so the, the drug dealers uh, in the corridors and um, uh, dangers outside that uh, makes people want to leave. All right, thank you for the for all the answers. And then I think we are moving a bit deeper into Kreuzberg. Uh, do you want to say something about the next, next part of the tour? Um, so again, um, it's uh, now it's it's my uh, favorite street um, for for a tour actually. Um, because we have three houses in the same street, um, three houses with very, very contrasting ownership. Um, so I think it's uh, the best spot, even though it's not a very remarkable street, to see uh, how residential markets work and how they could work. Just a few minutes from Hallisches Tor, there's Sosna Straße a very unremarkable street in the middle of Kreuzberg. And on the side at Sosna Straße number 16, a very unremarkable house owned by another investment fund from the international financial markets. This time it's Blackstone, one of the biggest real estate investors in the world, based in the US. And like any international financial markets investor, well, like most of them, and as a typical international financial markets investor, Blackstone's companies are based in Luxembourg and in the Cayman Islands. They bought the house through a share deal, which means they didn't pay tax. They shift their profits with a loan from Germany via Luxembourg to the Cayman Islands. They pay out huge management fees Actually, the owner of Blackstone, the founder of Blackstone, Mr. Schwarzman, made 500 million Euro, US dollars in 2019 from its management of assets. And the investors stay completely anonymous. What Blackstone does to the city and to the tenants becomes clear if you look just across the street. Sosna Straße number five with a remarkable, colorful facade was bought by its tenants in 1978, when houses were still rather affordable in Berlin for 200,000 Deutsche Mark at that time. After the loans were repaid, there was enough money to invest in a nice renovation, and this is where this colorful facade comes from. And by now, the houses are owned by the individual residents and their children, and there's no rent that they have to pay anymore. Just a few blocks down at number 48, there's a more recent uh, effort to get the house. A group of um, tenants there bought their house from the hands of an investor in 2016 with the help of Mietshäuser Syndicate, um, a cooperative that is trying to help tenants to buy their houses around Germany. And even though they have to pay uh, the loans for the house that wasn't as cheap anymore as the, the house we saw at number five, and even though they have to pay fees to meet the syndicate and the, and the people that um, bought the land for them, and they still manage to maintain their rents at somewhere between six and eight euros, which is in stark contrast to the house of Blackstone that is in the optimization phase, which means rents are increasing 
Um, and we've seen examples of apartments in this building being um, advertised for 16 euros and more. We know from tenants paying 11 euros and above um, for their apartments there, even though they're just across the street of the other house, where the rents are still kept at six to eight euros per square meter. So that's, I think, a, a very nice example. Uh, just here in the street, so close to each other, different models of owning real estate um, and very visible um, how international financial investors increase rents, extract profits from the tenants um, in the city and are not the only investors that can take good care of the houses. Thank you, Christoph, also for this uh, discussion um, opportunity because uh, uh, this brings us uh, to the topics that we have been also analyzing during this uh, three days conference. And uh, this was also the topic of the keynote that you gave uh, two days ago uh, together with uh, Manuel Gabarra de Sous. Um, and I think the discourse of the anonymous owners uh, is very important in Berlin also because not so many people uh, know about. Uh, this is also a big part of your research. Uh, you uh, made possible to give us data and numbers of apartments that are owned by anonymous people that uh, not so many people had access before. Um, so uh, my question would be, um, uh, if you can elaborate a bit more on that, also considering what we discussed uh, two days ago, and especially uh, what uh, uh, needs to be done at the institutional level to fight the presence of anonymous uh, owners in Berlin, and also which measures uh, need to be implemented by policymakers. So what do we have to what uh, is important to do also to guarantee transparency. We have been also working a lot with Transparency International in these days, uh, leading also to this conference. I know also you work uh, with them. Uh, and I think this is really the core of the important discussion that we should have at the political level in the city. OK, thanks. That's a lot of questions at once. I will try to um, answer them uh, as, as short and structured as possible. So. Um, I think the rent and also the purchase price explosion that we see in Berlin and also in many other cities of the world makes it clear that we need regulation uh, in the, in the, for the housing market. Uh, housing is a right, um, a natural right, and we need to regulate and make sure that everyone has access. But to be able to regulate, we first need transparency. We need to know who owns the city. We need to know with whom are we dealing. Uh, we need to know who can afford actually to, um, to be regulated and who we are trying to regulate in the first place. And because the land register and um, the corporate registers are so obscure and so badly and difficult to, to enter, this data is missing. So the German agency is neither the tax agency nor the uh, agency for housing nor the Berlin Senate has information of who owns the city. And that's why it's necessary actually to do uh, what we do with the support of many, many tenants here in Berlin. So individual tenants going to the land register, ask the information about who owns their building, and then collecting all these individual examples that we are visiting today at the tour um, to make, uh, make a picture of the whole thing. Um, and that's uh, what we're doing. And at the moment, we collected more than 1,000 examples, and we analyzed 400 out of them that are owned by companies. Uh, and uh, to show that uh, we need better regulation of transparency for companies in the first place. Um, and then so that we can see who owns the building, we need to know who owns companies. Uh, and uh, Berlin is currently working on a new form of register that combines the corporate registers and the land registers into one register uh, that has information on the rents being charged and the owners behind the buildings um, in one place for the city administration to access and to know how to regulate. Thank you. And there is also a question coming from the public now. Uh, you mentioned anonymity of ownership by uh, buying the company owning the building instead of the building itself. How are those companies initially um, legislated 
uh, that is what is involved in registering a company um, easy to create shell company or it is easy to create shell companies in Germany. So basically they want to know uh, which are these companies and also uh, what uh, re uh, involves registering a company and how easy it is to create uh, these uh, shell companies here in Germany. So there are many um, forms of companies with different rules and uh, companies from different places again with different rules but the most standard company, the GmbH or the Limited uh, in Germany, uh, you have to actually go to the notary and the notary has to register your company in the register and you have to put down 20, 25,000 euros um, as a share and once the notary has the confirmation of this money being in the account, he can open um, uh, the company for you in the register, so that's rather well monitored. Um, but it's very easy still to have shell companies so there's uh, lawyers and other service providers who do all this work for you so they go to the notary and they register the company for you they pay in the money into the account and then you just come and basically and they give them the company a name like brilliant 154 and then all you have to do is to buy this ready-made shell um, give it a new name give it a new manager um, and then you can immediately uh, go on with your dealings with this company. Um, but at least uh, you always have to, re if it's a limit, German Limited, you have to register every shareholder of this company with the corporate uh, register in Germany. What, when it gets more difficult is when the shareholders of the German company are actually companies from abroad. So it's, you don't have to be a natural person to be a shareholder. You can be a company again. And then you have situations where a company from the British Virgin Islands or the Seychelles, where you actually don't have to tell anyone uh, who is the owner or just a lawyer that uh, sets up the company might know something about the owner, but might even not know. Um, then you can use this company to own a company in Germany and then uh, anonymity is very easy uh, and usually very cheap for just a few hundred euros. Um, you get your anonymity um, and if you pay a bit more a few thousand and you get uh, some additional services people um, acting as a front for you uh, it's usually very cheap and easy to open companies thank you so uh, i would say we go on with the next uh, section For our last three stops, we leave big finance and enter the world of the wealthy individual real estate investors. Imagine now you're standing at the crossroads of Diefenbachstraße and Krefestraße, looking at the old trees around. Many of them, as well as the houses, have been around for decades, but in the recent past, several very glitzy owners have come and gone. One of them is Mr. Tecker, a multimillionaire from Denmark. Just before the financial crisis, he started to buy up several houses around here. And in good times, he owned more than 3000 apartments around Berlin. But after the financial crisis, he sold them off piece by piece and now owns only a few dozen as well as some commercial real estate here in Kreuzberg as well. And one of the apartments that stayed until very, very recently in the end was just here at one of the corners where he split up the house in individual condominiums, sold them very expensively and kept just one for his kids when they came to party and for himself probably. And I was visiting the apartment when it was supposed to be sold off for 8,000 euros per square meter. That was not a fancy apartment at all. And it was probably bought at 1,000 euros a square meter or something in, in that magnitude. So Mr. Tecker was trying to extract seven times his investment from this individual apartment in just a few years. Another company that was doing exactly the same around here and is still actively doing that, splitting up apartments, selling them as expensive investments to individuals, is Lebensgut. They use something of an anonymity made in Germany, as I would call it. So they use an Aktiengesellschaft 
that is a special form of a joint stock company that has one big advantage. Unlike with a normal limited company, the shareholders don't have to register in the normal company register. Instead, they register in the internal register of the Aktiengesellschaft that is not accessible to the public. Thanks to the beneficial ownership register, now any shareholder, even in the Aktiengesellschaft that owns more than 25%, has to register. But in this case, instead of the real owner, there was a lawyer that didn't seem to be able to own this amount of real estate. So we checked a bit further. We went and combed through old company documents and found some links to a real estate professional, prominent real estate professional here from Berlin, Mr. Ziegert. And together with the Berliner Zeitung confronted him and asked him whether he has anything to do with this company. Faced with the public pressure, he quickly admitted that it was him. He said that the wrong entry in the beneficial ownership register was an unfortunate mistake that he would correct immediately, but that he had opted for anonymity because otherwise he would pay just for his name a higher price for the buildings he was trying to buy. So we checked even further and checked a lot of other companies that own real estate in Berlin in our study of the beneficial ownership register and found that the mistake that Mr. Ziegert made was not just one example, but pointing to a systematic failure of the information contained in the beneficial ownership register. And hopefully this study that we just published a few weeks ago is going to help um, to change that so that in future, when you look in the beneficial ownership register, you can actually rely on that information. All right, we have another uh, question that came in from the audience. I think this also relates a bit to the answer you gave previously. So somebody asked how you arrived at the price tags you mentioned for establishing anonymity for your company. All right, maybe just a, a small misunderstanding in, in, the, in the question um, or in the answer. So the 25,000 euros that you have to invest to open a company, um, usually, uh, that's not money you have to pay. So you put this money into the company as a guarantee if something goes wrong, but this money is still yours, right? So you don't give it away. You just put it down in the account to ensure other people that you're able to pay and to maintain this company. And you can lower this 25,000 um, even down to, to just a few euros. If you, instead of the GmbH, you use an UG, uh, which is uh, kind of the, the European limited. Um, but that's, as I said, this is not the money that you lose. Um, the only money that you lose as a service fee, that's the few hundred euros that you pay for buying those corporate shells. And um, you, can, uh, you can actually find those price tags very easily in the internet. Uh, you will find companies with different services, different combinations offered. Um, and actually the example that we were just looking at, um, uh, Mr. Ziegert and the lawyer that he was using um, to own his, uh, or the lawyer he was using to act as a front for all his real estate investments here. This is a typical service provider. So he used to work in the past for one of the big listed companies. Actually, there exists so a company with several uh, hundred million euros of turnover only from selling corporate shells. Um, so he was working for them, then he quit and he has his own establishment in a small tax haven south of Berlin in Sossen, uh, where he um, goes on selling corporate shells. And you can just go to his website and you will see the different offers that he has. So he has the German companies for a few hundred euros. He's also selling now the new fashion. He's selling British companies uh, that are allowed to operate um, here in Berlin, thanks to European regulation, um, and that are easier to handle without any uh, service, uh, without the, the initial investment. Um, you can buy companies with accounts, uh, already anonymous accounts in some, uh, some faraway banks that don't cooperate in information exchange. Uh, you can buy, as I said, also uh, fronts and uh, directors that um, 
serve as fronts for you. And then things get a bit more expensive, but basically um, creating corporate shells is a mass business. So you have to open and sell several thousands of companies um, uh, to make a proper turnover at this price tag of a few hundred or a few thousand euros. Um, that is the market rate that you can find everywhere. All right. And then I also had a question about the, the video I showed, which is a bit about different trend, which you mentioned about owners splitting up apartments into smaller units um, to make more money, obviously, out of them. Is there no law against that in Berlin? So again, um, it's regulated. So there are protected areas, Milieuschutzgebiete in Berlin, uh, where you cannot just split up houses and sell them off individually. Um, and I, actually, that's that's already a peculiarity of Berlin. You don't have that in, in all other cities, that most of the houses in Berlin are still uh, registered as houses and not as individual apartments. So that's the, about two thirds of the Berlin houses are actually whole houses, so not individual flats that you can own individually, but you can only sell or buy the whole house at once. Right. So that's uh, that's the situation. But there is a trend and there has been a trend in the last years and a few like 10 to 30,000 apartments being or condominiums being created from those uh, from those houses every every year. Um, but as I said, in the areas in the Milieuschutzgebiet, in the protected areas that now comprise most of Berlin, um, you have to make a request to the city government um, to split up the house and the city government can impose some conditions. But usually, if you fulfill all the conditions, you can still go ahead with splitting up apartments. All right, then I think it's time to continue to the final section of the tour. Uh, would you like to introduce it, Christopher? We go straight for the final location. So um, I made the videos to speak for themselves, but uh, let me give at least one uh, one word of encouragement to stay with us for this last video because it's. Um, it's my favorite example of how anonymity can work. Um, and we, ha we haven't fully answered, or, or at least not, there are actually two examples, two of my favorite examples. One, one of the examples that we had some recent developments on the ownership um, that I will tell you after the video, and one uh, where we haven't reached the end yet. Um, so um, stay with us and enjoy this last uh, perfect examples of anonymity. Stop number six is Oranienstraße 25, and maybe another house that might be losing its anonymity as we speak. One of its residents is the bookstore Kish and Co. And they were already facing eviction by a previous owner, Mr. Berggrün, three years ago, and are now threatened to lose their rental contract to the new owner that just bought their house. And they're fighting like they did three years ago tooth and nail and with the support of the community around them against this eviction. And one thing they did was try to find the owner that they were dealing with. So on the communication they would receive, they always get letters from a Berlin law firm. And in the register, when they look at, they find a Luxembourg company, like in so many cases, that leads them to an investment company from the UK. But the company in Luxembourg, just like the Aktiengesellschaft in the previous example is a special company made for anonymity. The investors or shareholders, just like in the example of the Aktiengesellschaft, of this so-called SCSP, don't have to register in the traditional register in Luxembourg, like normal companies in Luxembourg do, but instead only are known internally. And again, the beneficial ownership register is supposed to change that situation. But just like in the German case of, uh, of Lebensgut, the beneficial ownership register doesn't contain the final beneficial owner, but instead contains three lawyers from Liechtenstein that are working according to the register as trustees on behalf of some final beneficial owner. In this case, we did an internet search with the three names of the lawyers and found them appearing several times in connection to a Swedish family 
called the Rausing family. These are some heirs that inherited several billion euros um, worth of assets from the founder of the Tetra Pak company, their father or grandfather, and are now working mainly as philanthropists, um, so spending the money that uh, they inherited and that they make from their investments on, uh, on a good purpose. We confronted them together with the press again. We don't have the final confirmation that it's really them and can until then only suppose that it's them. But we're still hoping that once they realize uh, who or what the money is doing in their name in Berlin and what their managers are doing on their behalf, they will change their mind and not evict the bookstore and realize that Doing good with money earned in a bad way doesn't make a lot of sense. The final stop of our tour takes us to the northeastern corner of Kreuzberg, or if you wish, to a very sunny but very dark corner of the global financial markets. This rather unremarkable house might have a very remarkable story to tell, but unfortunately it's not allowed to talk. The owner of the house like in so many cases of our tour today, is a company in Luxembourg. But this company is not owned by one of the big investment companies from the US or Canada, but instead managed by a small investment manager from the UK. And the owner shifted from Jersey in 2000, where it was initially registered in 2007, to the Seychelles in 2013, which is one of the most secretive, most difficultly accessible countries in this world. And one of the Berlin prosecutors once uh, just last year said in a, in a public speech that anyone who owns a company or owns a, German, a Berlin house through such a structure is completely out of reach of the law because if a prosecutor tries to obtain information on the owners in the Seychelles, usually he doesn't receive any answer. So look at the house here in the middle, in the corner of Kreuzberg and look at the address where the owners are registered just across the central from the marina many many thousand kilometers away and with this picture we'll end our tour of the financial markets and anonymity and I hope that when in future you pass by a house you do not only marvel at the architectural features or the need of repair, ponder the lives of the residents, but also sometimes wonder about the tales of economic injustice, financial crime, or fruitful human cooperation that it might be able to tell us. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy very Now, Christoph, we are really curious to know what are the next developments that you were mentioning. Uh, you say you have something more to say? Yeah, so um, back to the example of Oranienstraße 25. Um, I think that's um, a very good example to show um, uh, the work that, uh, or the meaning behind uh, finding the investors. A lot of tenants ask, but what does it help um, to know the owner? Um, what does it help if I, had, I can also talk to the manager? Um, in this case, um, I think we, you, can, you can very nicely see that it might uh, make a difference. Uh, so we, uh, as I said in the video, we addressed um, uh, the possible owner that we've identified and they have actually answered by now um, and are in negotiation um, with, the, with the tenants about uh, the future of the building. Um, the negotiations are still ongoing, so I can't say whether it will have a happy end. Um, but uh, I can at least say that uh, very likely the owners were not aware what is happening in their name. So they give their money to managers, um, to nice, uh, nice projects, uh, investment funds that say we uh, take good care of your money 
uh, and they give away their consciousness together with this uh, with a action to the managers who then say it's not actually us uh, we are doing this on behalf of someone else so it's kind of this structure is kind of an organized um, irresponsibility so the owners are very far away hiding behind the managers and don't know what is happening in their name and the managers say we're just doing this on behalf of someone else and um, earning fees with it and that's our perfect uh, task so we have to increase um, actually the rents we have to make the best of it because that's what we are paid for that's what we owe to our investors and if you break this uh, this anonymity this this organized irresponsibility and it's, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like taking um, taking the poor workers from Bangladesh to the H and M store um, and basically make people see what is happening on their behalf. So if you buy the cheap T-shirt in H and M, you see what that means for the production. And similarly, the owners of the houses uh, see what it means to get a return of 10, 15 percent every year from the money that they've given away. What that means to the lives of individual people, and that can sometimes help. It doesn't always help, right? People still go to H&M and investors will still continue looking for the highest return that they can get. Um, but in some cases, and, and that, that example of Oranienstraße is a good example, um, you will find owners that are actually honestly committed to do good in the world, right? So they say uh, they want to leave, uh, leave the world a better place and they inherited a lot of money and which gives them a lot of power. Uh, to do good things and to remind them that actually what they're doing is not what they they came to do in this world, what they pledged to do um, uh, can actually make a difference. And uh, I think that's going to be very interesting to see uh, what comes out of it. And w we see at the moment, so the, those, uh, the Rausing family, they're Swedish um, by origin, but now they live in Britain and they've been raised in Britain. And there might be a bit of a cultural divide between the Kreuzberg tenants and the noble, uh, noble British family. Uh, so we have to see how this discussion ends up, whether there will be some mutual uh, understanding created in the end. Um, but I think that's a very interesting and uh, uh, powerful case to show uh, how important it is to bridge the gap between the people and uh, their investors. And connected to this, there is a comment uh, from uh, um, the chat that uh, say uh, this is like the Rousing family, since the Achelius Foundation does a lot of charitable work for refugees, uh, shouldn't they care more about the critique from renters and cities? So Achelius, I think, is a, it's a perfect uh, example as well. Um, so again, you have a very aggressive investor that uh, uses red evictions uh, that is uh, famous, infamous around Berlin for using all the legal and kind of legal means to get rid of their tenants, letters, threats, uh, lawyers, um, uh, and uh, renovations at the border of the legal um, to get rid of their tenants and to increase rents and to rent apartments for 20 or even for up to 40 euros per square meter and they channel all this profit um, again through share deals and through profit shifting in, uh, in Cyprus and other places uh, to the Bahamas where there is no taxes due into a foundation that is completely transparent um, and the founder of, uh, of Achilles, Roger Achilles says okay I, he has nothing to do with it this money is in a foundation and that sounds like uh, nice in the first place um, and we can't uh, contradict him legally because we don't know what is the statutes and the legal setup of this foundation because that's completely intransparent. But it looks very likely that he or his family still controls all of these assets through this foundation. Um, and then you see that he, I think, I'm not 100% sure now about the numbers, but again, like just very recently, he re received a huge dividend payout of uh, more than 100 million euros from Achelius from the rent uh, that he's making here into his foundation in the Bahamas. And then from the Bahamas, from the Achelius Foundation there, he sent some of the money uh, for charitable purpose. But uh, and, and uh, he is one of the biggest um, or maybe even the biggest uh, donor of 
uh, of this uh, organization um, creating houses for refugees. Um, but if you look at the money that he spends on his philanthropy, on his engagement, it's a tiny share um, of what he actually makes every year. Uh, and it's not even what he should normally pay in taxes. Right? So you see that in many of the big philanthropic foundations, they don't pay tax. They avoid or evade tax wherever they can. And then they give a part of the money that they were actually supposed to pay in tax to philanthropy, so to purposes that they can control themselves, that they can use to build their public profile, that they can use to build their reputation, and that they can use also to, um, uh, to power and influence, because um, spending money on public purpose gives you power and control over the agenda and over what you want to do. Um, and then that's what they call um, responsibility. But if you look through it, and I this is a perfect point, it's not what happens because if, I think even more than the Rousing family, uh, he just spends a very small share of what he makes and uh, basically what he is not paying in tax for, um, for social purpose, for philanthropic purpose, uh, and makes the money from, uh, from non-social activities. And that's, uh, I think, completely contradictory. Uh, and a contradiction that we need to tell very clearly and very, make transparent uh, so he cannot use his uh, philanthropic uh, activity to uh, to pep up his public image um, while doing bad things on the other side. Thank you. I think also you know, commenting uh, the development of the story that you were saying that then the owner understood that uh, they were using the money in a bad way through financial investor. I think this really shows the importance of the work you do. Uh, so um, because you give uh, light to hidden uh, uh, data that uh, even the owners themselves uh, don't understand. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you could give a bit more uh, insight about your methodology. How do you acquire your data? Uh, in which way um, is it possible also to expand your own research in other contexts uh, for people that are listening to us from other cities, perhaps? So uh, if you would like to tell us a bit more uh, how you manage to get these information. All right, so um, first of all, um, a lot of the things that we're doing here is very manual and it's still ongoing. So as I said already before, we cannot access the land register in a structural way. We can only access the land register one by one. So we always need tenants to tell us who uh, signed the rent contract that they have or for tenants to go with their rent contract to the land register and find out the company and then Again, the work to find the owners behind those companies is rather manual. Um, there's some public or there's some data, private databases also to help in our research. Uh, there's a big corporate uh, database that is called Orbis that you can access through the library in London. Uh, and then there's also um, uh, other databases uh, like um, Thomas Daly or Immobile Insight, where you can um, see at least the professional investors and their transactions uh, registers. So we have some additional access to the database, but in the end, most of what we can do, every individual tenant can do as well. And we always need individual tenants to go to the land register and then uh, to pose the right questions to give context to our research. Uh, so I'd call again for everyone um, uh, who is here in Berlin or anywhere in Germany just to, uh, to send me the companies that they want to know, the owners. And uh, we have this project ongoing for, for, more, than, for more time. Uh, to support this kind of research. And uh, if you come from another country, if you're not from Germany, then you'd have to check again uh, for your starting point. If you're in the UK, for example, you can uh, access the register uh, easily uh, and you have data to start with um, electronically and already evaluated. If you're from Paris um, or from Australia, or from other places, you can access the land register or anyone can access without any permission but usually uh, gets very expensive. And I think in Paris, one information costs you 15 euros. In Australia, it's uh, several hundred dollars. Uh, so it can get very expensive very quickly. You'll have to find other solutions. 
we've seen in Dubai that there are sometimes leaks that you can work with. Uh, we've seen that on Friday. So you'd have to check first um, how to get this initial data. And uh, if this data is not easily accessible, then I guess one of your last hopes could be to do what we did here in Berlin uh, with the help of Correktiv um, to basically ask tenants through newspaper ads and newspaper campaigns uh, to send the information that they have because usually from their rental contract at least they have some idea, some starting point for the research to collect that and then uh, uh, go through the existing database and the existing registers um, to, to trace uh, the owners. Good, I know that leak also had another question. Uh, before I can read uh, one question coming from the audience that say, how does the internet internationalization of Berlin's tenants uh, affect resistance against uh, financialization? Are they making the problem worse? Um, so, who is making the problem worse? The financialization, I suppose. Um, I think that they the mean the, uh, uh, the, the fact the that Berlin. The international. Yeah, the, uh, okay. Uh, so I, I, I mean that's uh, that's a valid point. Um, we have several investors and several cases uh, actually that um, exploit international investors and also international tenants um, because they don't know um, they don't have uh, local knowledge. They never go to court. They never complain. They sometimes don't even know about the rules. Um, so that makes it easier for um, uh, for the investment managers. We had a case. Um, of um, investment uh, manager splitting up apartments and selling them uh, expensively to is investors from Israel uh, that don't know w the market well enough and that buy houses without seeing them uh, and often pay too much and are cheated easily cheated then um, by local uh, local um, agents. Um, <coughs> so. And also, I think that's that's something that uh, that you see that um, people who have connections to local government, uh, connections to the place they live, um, because they are there for the long term. Uh, if you if you push them away, you also lose a very very the strong base of democracy um, that is built on people identifying with the place they live and staying there and having a long term interest in what happening happen what happens around them because. They are not flexible and leaving with any change that they see, but they know uh, this place is the place that I grew up, that I live in, and I have to take care that it uh, in, evolves in the way it goes. So the point that you're making here, uh, the flexibility and the big changes and internalization has an effect on resistance. Um, but on the other hand, you can have, and we often see that, um, the time when a house that has a, a normal life is threatened to be sold to a financial investor is very often a moment for the people that live there actually to get together and resist together. And then it doesn't matter so much whether that's uh, international people or people who've been there for long usually have, at least here in Kreuzberg and other places, you have a healthy mix um, of creative people from outside, uh, long-term residents, uh, and the moment of uh, and the threat to lose your home, uh, the threat to be evicted, and the threat for your house to be sold to a financial investor to get those people together, uh, to talk to each other and to build uh, resistance in their house. Um, so I think um, it goes both ways, and we have to live with the situation that we're in. And I think it's a natural development also that. Um, uh, the residents change a bit, that there's uh, interest for people from uh, around the world to come to Berlin. And the city lives of that, the city also profits from that. Uh, and uh, you shouldn't put the blame for the developments at the, at the people, the individual tenants um, that might be uh, ready to pay high rents. Uh, it's not them who, who change the structure, but it's uh, it's always a much bigger problem. It's not individual tenants, but it's always um, bigger structures behind the ownership uh, and the politics that uh, are responsible. And 
I think I would be very, very careful to not start this uh, this discussion and this fight between old residents and new people arriving and play them against each other um, because it's not them that are the enemies of each other and the enemy of a, a city that is worth living in, but they have a common enemy and that's uh, that's the speculative investors and not all investors uh, are enemies. I'm not saying that, but they should focus on uh, on the common target that they both have in common, the new and the old residents, uh, to make this place uh, a place worth living. Thank you, Christoph. I think Elik had the question. Yes, I would like to, to ask one more thing about the, the recent study that you published on transparency and anonymity in the real estate market. So this study was published, I think, two, three weeks ago. So maybe uh, could you say something how it has been received so far and also uh, what are the next steps for this research project and how will it continue after this? So the study that we've just published um, is basically just a intermediate research. So um, it's not the final end of our study of our work. Uh, so we've published, we're, oh, that's, it's an ongoing process. We collected those examples and we keep collecting new examples and adding them to our database. We research their owners. And then once we know the owners, we look at their financial statements and at their behaviors and we um, uh, analyze the ownership. And that's what, what we are currently doing. So out of this collection of several or well, more than thousand cases, uh, we, we are assembling a picture um, of the whole market. So for example, we we get a house, one of them that we have seen in the story today, the final house that is owned through the Seychelles. We do the research until the end. Um, and in this case, it's a Seychelles company. And then we check, does this Seychelles company own other apartments in Berlin? And actually we've found several already. And then we add all this information together to get a, a picture of, uh, of who owns the city. And that is a study that we're gonna publish uh, as soon as uh, time allows uh, and uh, Corona allows to publish. Uh, and then we're gonna uh, use this methods and also um, create um, or make our data accessible to tenants to continue the discussion of who owns Berlin and also who owns Germany um, through our research. I have also an additional question. I'm curious is so far you had any political response to your research? How, how has been the feedback from the political sides of Berlin? Uh, um, what was the effect so far? So um, we've actually seen, and also that this project exists with this size, I think is already a sign of the very strong interest um, in Berlin of, of work in that sort. We've, started about two or three years ago with the Trockland case at Checkpoint Charlie um, that we've shown. Um, and uh, it's been a case to, uh, to call public attention and politicians uh, have noted and actually there has been, or the, the building, the construction permit for that area has been rene renegotiated um, based on the discussion. Um, so we've shown that not all money is welcome in Berlin. And I think this uh, this mindset has uh, started to change for many politicians. Let's say, okay, we should ask who comes here and we don't welcome any money, any investor, uh, just because he's bringing money. Um, we've also seen other developments. We have the rent cap now, we have the discussion of expropriation. Uh, and uh, I think also this then this campaign of expropriation um, has helped to remind the city that so the the um, the campaign has asked to expropriate anyone who owns more than 3,000 apartments in Berlin. And the Senate was trying to find out who actually does. And they've seen that they don't know. Uh, we've we've uh, found several examples to show that there are more investors uh, owning 3,000 apartments that this city has never heard of. And this has changed the awareness in the, in the, in the city. And we've seen several attempts already to change the situation of the register. Um, when we were discussing the beneficial ownership re register in the federal parliament uh, last year, real estate had been the most important topic and we've passed some new laws to increase transparency. 
And uh, back in Berlin, we're again trying to create a new register that I've already shortly mentioned uh, to actually get this information of who owns buildings in a structural and central way. Um, and I think all this, uh, this research is very well received um, uh, by politicians because they face questions from their constituents. Uh, they want to change the situation. They try to regulate the rental market and they feel that they lack information and they're happy with any information that they can get. Thank you. And I also wanted to add to that, uh, that uh, if people are more interested in your research, they want to dig in depth of uh, what you are doing. We also recorded a um, longer video contribute for our conference, Evicted by Grid. And uh, you can find uh, the video contribute uh, of Christoph about an uh, anonymous owner in Berlin uh, on disruptionlab.org slash evicted minus videos and we are also going to uh, save uh, your uh, tour there um, and i think uh, now we are at the i understood that the time is over uh, so we really would like to thank you because this tour is very interesting and we have also idea to expand it in the future uh, and, uh, for example, we notice uh, that uh, Neukölln is missing. Uh, uh, all of us of the Disruption Network Club are living there. <laughs> and also our office is there. We really want to know what is going on there. Uh, so this uh, is my invitation to do a next session uh, about Neukölln. You also told me you are developing uh, some studies there already. And uh, so uh, by concluding today, uh, first of all, we want to thank you and uh, also mention what will be the next events at the Disruption Network Club, because uh, despite the corona, we have been doing a lot uh, online in these days. We are uh, every Friday having a disruptive Friday. There will be also two coming in June. Uh, and of course, so we did this conference of three days. Uh, as I say, you can find the material on our website with longer contributes, uh, but also the videos of the live streaming with all the participants that have been part of this conference, uh, including Christoph. Um, so now I would like just to introduce together with Lieke what is uh, uh, coming next. We are planning finally the uh, real life uh, film screening of a push uh, at Akud. Um, and uh, uh, we should, uh, we, we are planning it uh, outdoor uh, the um, 30th of July. Um, the film push, we have been discussing uh, about it also during this day, together with uh, the director of Frederick uh, Gerten and also Leilani Fara, that uh, is the main character of it. Uh, Leilani was giving a keynote yesterday, so we will all meet uh, at a good the uh, July 30 to finally watch this film of together. If there are no other Corona interruptions, we hope not. <laughs> and uh, uh, after that, we are planning another event uh, still at a good the 12th of August. Uh, this uh, is another screening uh, outdoor. Uh, of Never Whistle Alone, that is a film about uh, Italian whistleblowing. And being an Italian, I'm very happy to say that uh, we want to show this film um, from Marco Ferrari. And uh, we will also have um, the producer of the film, Priscilla Roboledo from The Good Lobby, that is coming uh, and discussing uh, the film with us. Uh, we are going to do this uh, film screening in partnership with the Human Rights Film Festival. And uh, we will discuss about whistleblowing and anti-corruption because this film is all about uh, how to fight corruption in Italy. Um, now then I pass uh, the word to Lick that is going to introduce what is happening next that also involve Christoph again. Yes. So yeah, we're still happy to, to do also the real actual physical tour with Christoph. So we will do this uh, on the 30th of August. And we will do again uh, this visiting the invisible tour, but this time in real life. So we will go with the group of us walking through Berlin and we will be at the actual sites uh, and Christoph will tell us more. 
Um, so yeah, we hope to see also many of you back for this. Um, and then after we're, after that, shortly after, we have one more event, which is also connected still to our Evicted by Greed conference. So um, we did an online workshop on subvertising for the right to housing, but we will do the second part of this workshop, which is actually uh, in person at the supermarket space in Berlin Kreuzberg. Uh, on subvertising for the right to housing, together with the Steel Disposter Collective, who also gave a great presentation and showed a short film during our conference yesterday. And also Kunstblock and Beyond will be there to participate. So this will be on the 3rd of September. And if you want to stay updated about all these events that are coming up at the Disruption Network Lab, you can sign up to our newsletter, so then you will receive all the, the updates in your email. And then you can go to disruptionlab.org slash newsletter to sign up so that you're sure to attend all the events on time and be informed also about our next conference, which will be coming up towards the end of September. So yeah, now we come to really to the end of our online weekend of Evicted by Greed. So also thanks to everybody for joining us today for the tour. And uh, we hope to yes. see you at all of our next events. <laughs> And I also would like to conclude by thanking again the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung that have been making possible the tour uh, together with uh, Christoph. The tour will be also visible on their website. And uh, especially for the tour, we have to thank again our internal production, uh, Elena Velianoska, that has been working so hard with all the video contributes uh, and our video team and the Jonas Franke that has been working on the graphic uh, and again Rana Adikari that uh, is uh, the master of the streaming behind the scene. And of course, Christoph uh, Troutwetter, we really want to thank you because you have been very important for our conference. We have been developing together a lot of topics for it. Uh, and we are really happy to go on uh, working together with you for the development of this tour. And uh, so uh, we have already the, 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 the idea of uh, the date of the 30th of August, but uh, uh, we want also to imagine there will be other tours in the future. So now we start our adventure of the tours. <laughs> Let's see where we will go. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Christoph, again.